Welcome to In City Hotspots Biz Chaps Podcast. Today we're joined by Eddie Campirano, a dynamic leader vying for place three at the Port of Brownsville. Join us as we explore his visionary approach to economic growth and sustainability in our city's maritime industry. Let's dive right in. Eddie, uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us here at uh, our Biz Champs in City On Spot podcast. We're excited to have you today. I'm and excited to be here. Thank you. And uh, let's uh, let's get right into it. Okay. Today we're joined by Eddie Campirano, vying for place three at the Port of Brownsville. With decades of experience shaping the maritime landscape, Eddie, could you share what inspired you to, to pursue this position and how you envision navigating the future waters of the port? Uh, absolutely. Having just left the port at the end of uh, December after 16 and a half years, uh, um, a lot happened within those 16 and a half years. You know, when I arrived at the port, it was a lot of the discussion was how do you become a port? Well, I think 16 and a half years later, we've arrived. I think for me, the issue is how do you take it where the port is today in its peak of its performance ever? How do you take it to the next level? And so I think there's still a lot that needs to be done to do that. Uh, uh, Port has enjoyed great success uh, these last few years. Uh, It is thriving. Uh, It has become a busy center of commerce, uh, a lot of jobs. It's the largest industrial employer in the region. You know, over 5,000 people work at the port. And, And that number is projected to more than double over the next five years. So it's an exciting time to be at the Port of Brownsville. And so I think my uh, inspiration or my desire to remain involved with the Port of Brazil, uh, especially on the policy side, is to run for a position on the Brazil Navigation District uh, Commission, Board of Commissioners. And so I filed uh, to do that uh, uh, this year. I think that a lot of the experience that I have gained throughout my um, uh, career, uh, and, in various, both in the public sector and in the private sector. And certainly, uh, what I've learned about the port and, you know, learning this from the ground up over the last 16 and a half years, uh, it really makes an impression on you. Uh, there, there's something about the port that's just special. And I certainly want to see it continue to succeed. And uh, like I said, I think the, uh, the biggest issue is to ensure that we remain, uh, working towards the goal of, of, of continuing to grow and continuing to bring business to our community, um, making a significant regional impact, you know, jobs are critical. And one thing about the port and the maritime industry is not a minimum wage employer. And those are the kinds of jobs we really need to kind of lift that tide, if you will. You know, a lot of those jobs out there are jobs that, you know, a family of four can, you can save money there, send the kids to college, you can buy a home. Uh, it's not a service job, and so consequently, uh, it has a potential to just be a huge, huge uh, benefit to the region, not only economically, uh, but certainly in the terms of uh, um, improving the living conditions for so many people in our region. Eddie, with your extensive background spanning various pivotal roles within the community, from city planning to port direction, your qualifications are undeniable. Can you delve into the specific experiences and skills that make you a suitable candidate for the important role of port commissioner? Well, I think one is that I have had a very um, varied and diverse uh, career, not only in the public sector, but certainly in the private sector as well. And I've had, you know, have over 40 years of extensive executive management experience uh, in leadership roles, uh, not only uh, leading organizations, but working within organizations. Um, I have an extensive, uh, you know, community participation background. I've done my civic duty. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think I have the skills necessary to, as the moniker says, navigate the future waters at the port. You know, I understand budgets. I know how to put them together. I know how to 
read them. I know how to succeed with budgets. Um, uh, same thing goes for projects. You know, the port industry is a very capital intensive industry. Nothing out there is cheap. Building a dock, you know, it's not something you do overnight. Uh, I have project management experience. I've got experience with grant administration. Um, you know, I've been part of uh, negotiating multi-billion dollar contracts. You know, all of the elements that are necessary to uh, continue to, uh, you know, be part of the team. It's not an individual task. It's part of being a team that can certainly make the the policy. And uh, I think the commission has oversight of the port. It is not the sole uh, implementer and the sole decision maker. While it has an opportunity to direct decisions, um, more than anything, it has a, a, an oversight responsibility. And, and certainly the financial matters of an organization are probably the most important uh, aspects of oversight that are necessary. So uh, I believe I have the experience and understand uh, and then certainly um, uh, can direct and, and be part of a team that can certainly provide the adequate guidance and, and oversight necessary to keep uh, the, the port uh, in, in a prosperous role. Addressing the challenges ahead is vital for the Port of Brownsville's continued success. Eddie, could you shed light on what you perceive as the most pressing issues facing the port and what strategies do you propose to tackle them, drawing from your wealth of experience? Well, I, again, I think the biggest challenge is how do you take advantage of where the port is today uh, to keep focused on uh, continued growth. Uh, the projects that are in the works at the Port of Brazil, whether it's the deepening of the ship channel, which I was often asked what was the most important at the port, and I see the deepening of the ship channel the number one project, uh, not because it really talks about the sustainability of the port into the future. Uh, existing customers want to bring in more cargo, which means they want to come in with bigger ships. Well, those bigger ships need a deeper channel to do that. But to support that effort, you still have a lot of infrastructure uh, projects that need to happen. The dock improvements, you know, building new docks, uh, supporting the customer's needs in terms of what do they need to continue to grow. And so all of those elements, I think, are just critical. I think strategically, the most important thing is to be prudent uh, in not only in how those projects are implemented, uh, but they're done uh, with the fiscal prudency that's necessary to, uh, again, stretch the port's finances. Uh, one of the things about ports is that ports are unlike other, they're not like the city or the county. Uh, ports don't have a, a, a direct uh, revenue stream that is supported from the government. You know, no sales taxes, uh, property taxes are minimal. Uh, there is no funding directly from any federal or state agency. So ports have to operate like a business. Um, you essentially have to generate the revenue not only to operate, but also to undertake capital improvements. So uh, it really is, it's, it's kind of one of the things about a port that I find fascinating that even though it's a governmental body, it has a very entrepreneurial spirit. And the Port of Brazil is what you would describe a landlord port. A port owns a lot of land. And so that land is utilized by private sector businesses to develop their facilities and to implement their businesses. And from that business, then the other part of the component is the maritime side, meaning vessels and boats coming in and out, you know, all of those facilities and necessary support the loading and unloading of a vessel. Well, that's the other part of the revenue the port receives. You know, the, the channel, the ship channel uh, is like a toll road. You know, the, a vessel has to, you know, pay a toll to be able to come use it, land at a dock, unload its cargo. For every day it's there, it is paying to the port revenue. Uh, the cargo that moves off and off the dock also pays revenue. About 75% of the revenue that the port generates uh, is derived from the real estate of the rent on the land and the use of the port facilities to load and unload uh, cargo ships. So uh, all of that has to function, has to be kept up with the growth necessary by our tenants. And, and so all of that is, I, I think, is, is again, a very important, uh, especially as it relates to what is coming in the future with these large projects. And deepening uh, the ship channel is key uh, to much of that growth that is projected for the future. 
Achieving economic growth while preserving the delicate environmental balance is paramount for sustainable development. Eddie, how do you envision promoting the robust development of the Port of Brownsville while conscientiously balancing environmental concerns, given your extensive background in strategic planning and management? Well, I think, you know, I think you kind of, you said it, is how do you find that balance between being able to provide, uh, you know, economic progress while at the same time being a good steward of the land? You know, the port is the largest landowning public port authority in the United States. It has 40,000 acres plus of land. Yeah, that's a lot of land. But because the port owns all that land doesn't mean it's going to develop all that land. In fact, I would venture to say that probably 60 to 75% of that land will never be developed. And part of it is because the environmental sensitivity of that land. (laughs) That does not mean that that land has no value. It does. One of the things that the port is fortunate is, is that it owns enough land that it can insulate itself from having other type of growth beginning to encroach on the port and creating conflicts. Uh, You're not going to see an industrial facility in your backyard because where those facilities should go is the port. They're not going to go to in the middle of town. They're not going to go in a surrounding residential neighborhood. So that land footprint allows the port to be selective with the kind of industry that can come in, but it won't necessarily have to deal with conflicts with the neighbors. The other part about it is because it is a large landing port, owning port, is that when there are issues that impact the environment, you know, there are ways to mitigate that impact uh, for, uh, and, and a lot of the, the development that occurs at the port is heavily regulated by the federal government and environmental is one of the biggest. So somebody just can't go and start digging a hole in the channel. Somebody just can't go and start building on port land. A lot of that falls under government scrutiny, federal government scrutiny. And the vast majority usually is dealing with environmental concerns. Uh, For example, some of the projects at the port, uh, they may have a large project and there may be what they call wetlands that they would disturb or they would need to use. Well, in that impact is that you have to do environmental assessment. Uh, You have to go through the process if and when a project is viable and an environmental plan is developed for it. Um, if somebody uses, let's say, 10 acres of wetlands, it may have to replace it with 100 acres of wetlands. And so, and it can also be used to enhance other areas that can make those wetlands better and more productive. So there is finding that balance. I will tell you, the Port of Brownsville has been successful in numerous environmental stewardship programs. You know, the Bahia Grande project, you know, that was done because of the port. The land that was dedicated to actually flood the Bahia was through port property. Um, There was another uh, project way back in the 80s. There was going to be a refinery built at the Port of Brownsville. And as a way to mitigate that refinery, um, the port set aside over 4,000 acres, 4,200 acres of land that it entered into a lease with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 40 years to basically preserve that land. Well, one of the projects, the large LNG project in this case, not only took that concept, but also provided about 4,000 acres in mitigation, both wildlife and for wetlands. And part of that on port-owned property is 1,500 acres was put in a conservation easement that it will never be developed in perpetuity. And that was a win-win because it set aside valuable real estate or valuable land that's environmentally sensitive that will never be developed, but but the port was compensated for taking that land and putting in that perpetual uh, perpetual conservation easement. Well, that was to a tune of $22.5 million. Originally, it was going to be 3,000 acres, but it wound up being 1,500. So there are ways that you can find that balance and mitigate. But I do think that, you know, the, the, the concept of just because you have land, you're going to develop it. That, that's not the case in the port. Uh, like I said, I, I, I believe the majority of the land that the port has will never be developed, but it will help uh, insulate other uses, and it will continue to support the wildlife, whether it's the Alpamado falcon or other uh, wildlife, both flora and fauna, 
that exists. Uh, you know, the port is a beautiful place, and and part of it of its beauty is the land that it has. And you know, I don't see any prospects for developing the majority of that land. It's just not going to work. Eddie, as the cornerstone of community prosperity, job creation is fundamental. What strategies do you propose to enhance job opportunities and foster workforce development within the port, leveraging your vast experience in fostering economic growth? Well, I think, you know, um, um, you know I, I'm a big believer in providing opportunity. I think, I think a lot of this is about if we create the opportunities, we know that we have the labor force that will take advantage of those opportunities. And I always point to Keppel Amphils, which is now uh, Cetrium Amphils. You know, here's an international company. It's been in our community for over 30 years. You know, they're competing in a global in, in a global environment. Uh, and one of the things about what they do there is that you know they've done some things at Keppel that have never been done anywhere in the world. You know, we've built the largest land rig. In, in the world uh, that is that that was built in Keppel and taken off to the North Sea uh, for use in offshore oil drilling. Uh, th there's examples, you know, most recently, Keppel is the only uh, uh, shipyard in Texas that's actually building ocean-going vessels. Nobody else is doing that. It hasn't been done in Texas since when it was done in Houston uh, to support World War II and the war effort. Uh, these are container ships. Uh, it is building the largest, what is called the hopper dredge. It's used to maintain channels in the U.S. fleet. It's building it right now for a company called uh, 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 Manson Construction. And it's also building the first of its kind vessel in this country that will be used to transport and erect the offshore wind turbines. Well, it's those kinds of opportunities that are reflective on the kinds of skill sets that you know, we have the labor force providing that opportunity. We can fill those. But I will tell you, you know, uh, workforce training, uh, uh, creating those jobs, you know, that's a collaborative effort. You know, that is, that's a collaboration with the schools, with the, the, the community college, uh, with all of the entities that are in the region. And I have never seen as much collaborative dialogue between everyone about looking beyond just the baccalaureate degree, a four-year degree in college, to begin to focus on skills, training, jobs. Uh, a lot of these jobs are there to be had uh, and actually would pay better than someone just coming out of college with a four-year degree. So uh, there's a lot of effort. I think one is continue to collaborate uh, with our local community college, with our local school districts, with TSTC, you know, all of those. But to me, the key is also involving the employers in that. They know what they need and they can help direct and prepare and be involved in creating the environment for the necessary job training that can provide those jobs to our community. And there's a lot of that going on now. A&M has an initiative. They're getting, they just announced the development of a training facility at the Port of Brownsville. Again, focusing on the jobs around the port, but not just those, the, the jobs in the region. You know, for too long, we've been training or educating our kids to leave. Uh, they want to stay home. They want to come back, and we have to create those opportunities to keep them here. Transparency and accountability are the bedrock of effective governance. Eddie, what measures will you implement to ensure transparency and accountability in the operations and decision-making processes of the port, building upon your track record of prudent and strategic leadership? Well, I, I think you're right. I think transparency is key. Uh, you know, one of the challenges I had when I went to the port was that, uh, you know, the port was at an all-time low with the failed bridge project. You may be too young to remember, but I'm sure your dad would. Uh, the bridge to nowhere, a lot of money was spent. There were seal indictments issued. You know, the port's credibility was at an all-time low. And, and, and one of the ways that was necessary to rebuild that trust in the community is transparency. If we were going to be in the news, we weren't going to be in the news for doing the wrong things. We were going to be in the news for doing the good things, the right things. How do we lead? Uh, and so uh, I think that effort is paramount, you know, communication with the community, developing tools to continue to do that, educating the community. You know, one of the things that really changed our lives and the ports are no probably impacted significantly from this. Well, 9-11, it changed the way we live. 
It used to be a time when you can go to the fort and see what was going on. Those days are over. You know, the port is a secure facility. It comes under the federal government's rule. So you just can't go into the port and see what's going on. Uh, finding opportunities to get people, what I call, you know, get them behind the curtain into the belly of the beast to see what's happening, doing more of that. The port has done that. You events at the port, uh, you know, boat tours at the port, uh, you know, bringing in people to see what's actually going on. But I think the biggest thing that goes about being transparent is also how do you manage your button? You know, how do you fiscally uh, exercise your right uh, with the use of taxpayers' money? And that has to have an element of transparency that, you know, gives people confidence in what is happening there. Um, you know, they can be assured that their, their resources, the community are being used in the right way. Um, there are laws, there are regulations, there's independent, uh, auditing principles that are applied by outside auditors that come in and write your books. And of course the port has a whole series of policies that it itself has to follow and implement, whether it's in procuring services and products whether it's how it makes decisions to spend. Uh, there are limits set on who can make a decision to spend what amount. And ultimately the commission and its responsibility for fiscal oversight is the final entity that would determine how it's going to make its expenditures. And all of that has to be done in a public setting. And the reporting of that also has to be open and, and available for the public inspection. All of that needs to continue. That doesn't mean there aren't ways to uh, improve that process, both on the accountability side as well as on the transparency side. And I think as we continue to grow, as the port continues to grow, you're going to see more and more of that, not only because people will demand it, but it's simply because it's good business. And so I, I personally believe that you will see that to continue to evolve because, again, it is good business. And if you can't be in partnership with your community, you know, your business is in trouble. Innovation drives progress and efficiency. Eddie, how do you intend to foster a culture of innovation and drive technological advancements within the operations of the port, utilizing your experience in embracing innovation to achieve strategic objectives? Well, I think one of the things that ports are going to, their ports are evolving just like anybody in the industry. And there are some huge uh, efforts going on in ports. Probably the biggest uh, innovation you're going to see in ports is going to be uh, looking at alternative uh, uses of fuel, you know, uh, looking at electrification as it relates to operating large equipment for loading and unloading. You're going to see a move that already is happening in the major ports of the United States. It's obviously happening abroad. Uh, you're going to see that becoming more and more the norm in the port industry. And a lot of that also means working with your tenants, your customers. Uh, you know, they like, for example, the port doesn't unload the vessels. The stevedores unload the cargo. Uh, they're moving away from the technology and they're moving more into technology, more efficient equipment, greener equipment, electric equipment, electrification of the docks is going to be necessary. As we begin to see this evolution of moving away from, from uh, um, uh, you know, hydrocarbons or green, ha uh, green um, 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 gas fuels and moving at non-green, uh, non, uh, um, um, uh, you know, hydrogen uh, and ammonia and things of that nature, all of that is going to be uh, developed through innovation. Uh, and ports are going to have to live out with the times. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to have to be. Uh, the federal government is going to be mandating some of those. Uh, state government may move slower than the federal government will, but those are going to be the environments that ports are going to have to move into. And that means you have to prepare both in terms of training and the ability to implement those new procedures. And you're beginning to see more and more of that. In some of our tenants, we're going to see more automation going on in the port industry. Uh, I think you're starting to see some of that in some of the larger Entities, you know, finding more efficient ways uh, through automation, not necessarily replacing employees, but you're going to see that impact of automation in the port industry as well. Uh, and, you know, you, you, I mean, the ports are going to have to 
pivot. They're going to have to keep up with the movement of the tenants, uh, with the industry. And the maritime industry is going to be a leader in a lot of that innovation that's going to occur uh, as we see our community move away from, you know, uh, um, the, the dynamics of, you know, doing things the way we've always done it. Remaining competitive in the global market is essential for the port's continued success. Eddie, how do you plan to ensure that the Port of Bronzo remains competitive and adapts to evolving market dynamics, drawing from your experience in strategic planning and positioning? Well, I think the biggest thing is that the port has to assure the users that the services and the infrastructure and everything that they need to succeed here is provided. Uh, you're not going to remain competitive if you price yourself out of the market. You're not going to be remain competitive if you can't provide the proper services or equipment necessary to unload the ships. Uh, you know, the, the more and more you drive that cost up for the user, the more and more they're going to look elsewhere uh, to receive that service. Um, and you know, ports are ports are in business to allow other businesses to to grow. And I mean, you know, again, uh, you know, if, if a, if a particular business leaves or one of the things about, let, let me kind of talk a little bit about the global environment, you know, things that happen around the world, you know, we live in this global and we talk about, oh, we live in a global economy, but we don't really do we, how, how do we feel it? You will feel it at the port. I'll give you one very specific example that's in everybody's minds right now. February 22nd of 2020, two. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine, the port immediately felt that because before that happened, most of the steel, steel slab that is coming into the port was coming from Russia and Ukraine. Well, that stopped. So we saw a dip in the business. Now, it took some time before those shippers of that slab found other sources to be able to bring it up again, but you feel it immediately. There can be a decision made in some foreign government that affects the business of the port. Decisions made in Mexico could immediately impact us because so much of what the port does uh, is trade with Mexico. If the Mexican president says, we're going to stop this, it affects the port, you immediately feel it. But the same thing can happen if it happens in Europe or Asia and other places. So, But the biggest thing uh, to ensure uh, the global competitiveness of the port is that, well, one, the, the channel deepening is paramount. But being able to keep up with the demands of those users that they need to ensure their cargo gets here safely uh, and that continues to come all the time. And so, so you're going to have to be up to the task, providing the equipment, providing the services, providing the capabilities, and supporting all of those users that are integral to making that, come, uh, that, that shipper successful. Uh, uh, you know, we all have to work together to do that. So um, it's it's a task. It's a task. And uh, uh, but you know, the, the 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 people at the port who are in that business, you know, they match up with anybody else. And so uh, you know, again, you know, so much of what the port needs to do is to ensure that all of those individuals that it takes to unload a vessel, that they got all of the necessary services and the infrastructure the port needs to provide adequate to allow them to do that job. Everything's machine, machinery, or is it? A, no, it's man. It's I will man. tell you there is, I'll give you an example, a, a, a slab vessel coming in with 50,000 tons of slab. Uh, and these are pieces that are anywhere from each piece of steel that, you know, bigger than this room from here to here, from 16 tons a piece to up to 33 tons a piece. If a ship of that size is coming to unload 50, thousand metric tons of slab um it takes stevedores the the people that unload the ship well it may take five gangs of stevedores 20 people per gang up to four days five days to unload that vessel and so it's everything from getting it out of the ship there's a stevedore in the what they call the hold where they hold the cargo making sure that when the the machinery is necessary, whether it's a magnet to take that piece is done properly to get it out of the hole, 
the 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 operator of that crane that's doing that and getting it out, lay it on the ground, putting it those stevedores that are there on the ground. From there, moving it onto a truck. From there, moving it onto the storage yard. From there, moving it onto the train. I mean, it's it's a process, and and these guys are very good at it. They know what they do. Uh, more steel slab moves through the port of Roswell to Mexico than any other port in the United States. But it takes it takes a lot of people to make it work. Everything from a ship agent who's going to provide all those services for that ship to be able to leave, to come to the port, to arrange for the pilots to board it so they can help the captain from a foreign country navigate it through the channel uh, to get the tugboats to be there waiting for them to help them in, to secure the dock. I mean, it is it is a process. It takes a lot of people to make it work. And so once it gets to the port and it gets to where it needs to leave the port, Loading it on the railroad, getting it to the railroad, you know, loading those railroad cars, crossing the bridge, going to, I mean, it is a significant process. But you know what? That's where all the jobs are. And those are good paying jobs. Those are very good paying jobs. And so uh, that's what the business of the port is all about when you talk about the marine side of it. I don't know where I've been at. I mean, um, you know, I just turned 40. Uh And, you know, I mean, for the last 40 years, I, I'm learning so much right now as, as we're speaking. How do you, how do you, is there, act, you said everything has changed, right? Since yeah. after September 11th. Yeah, yeah. Um, how can there be more awareness for, for well, children, for, yeah. for youth, right? right. To, I mean, I, if I would have known yeah. this years ago, maybe I would have chosen yeah. a different yeah. path. Well, I will tell you that some of the things that the port has done and will continue is, like I said, you know, there are days when there's celebrations to, you know, the, the 80, the, the, like the 90th anniversary of the port is coming up. Well, that's one of the few times we actually up and up the port to the community and we'll open up to thousands of people to go there and see and we do boat tours or bus tours and they can actually see what happens. There is, a, there is an event that we started doing there about 14 years ago. It was part of the city's effort, the biggest loser deal, where we, we do a five, one mile 5K run walk at the port. We've kept doing it every year. And every year it grows. And the reason we did it was to really open it up to families and kids. And, you know, Gabriel is very familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, we see more and more of the school running clubs coming. And it allows us to get them into the, de- and actually see the water while they're running and see the ships that are there. Those are the kinds of things that you just can't do. We do find opportunities. We see more and more schools, high schools from the valley, from here coming to see the port, you know, we'll get, they're giving tours. Uh, uh, you know, we have those events where we can open it up. Uh, so more and more needs to occur because you just don't get an appreciation about what happened by simply driving past it on the way to the island. You don't. And, and I think that's the part that opens everybody's eyes and goes, I had no idea this was going on. When I went to the port, I thought, Hey, you know, I've been involved with municipal government. I'm from here. I know, I know what's going on. I, I didn't even know half of what was going on at the port. You know, that's what's fascinating about the port. And, you know, I, I think not only our community, but the region is finally coming to understand the importance of having a, a facility like that in our community because they you just don't have them everywhere. You know, there's just a handful of ports to you know, when you measure it to a handful of, of cities or a handful of counties, uh, uh, it's, it, it, and, and they're all, you know, economic drivers in their own region, some huge, some small, but they all play an important role. And uh, finding ways to, again, get the community, you know, behind the curtain to see is always a challenge. But there are occasions that do occur, and, and, and the port takes full opportunity of doing that. Now, separate from these community, big community events that give opportunity, right, um, for families and, and, and the youth. Like you said, the port is just a handful of ports, right? Um, we also have just a handful of um, field trips mm-hmm. that, you know, become repetitive once in a while. Yeah. Is, this an op- is, this, is there an age minimum for field trips? Is it geared more for, like, middle school and high school? 
or are elementary, is this safe enough for elementary it's, to often you know, use as field I trips? Think, I think all of them are different. They're logistically different. You know, I can tell you that the, the port has received uh, buses with kids that can go see the port. Now, there's things you can and cannot do. I mean, you know, when you talk about going to see the port, if it's in a school bus, you might drive and go to see where things happen and actually get to see the dock and all that, but you don't get off the bus. You know, that's the one thing about that that is very uh, difficult to do is to, you know, get people out to, you know, go see it and do it. But you can. I mean, the port does field trips for schools, not in mass, but you do get, I mean, I, I know there's schools that come from Mission, from FAR, from Harlan, the Brazel schools. The, the port has a cooperative agreement with BISD uh, for workforce training as well as adult education and training. So, and, and those individuals in those programs get to come and experience going through the port and sitting in the port and doing it. But, you know, um, those things can be done. And I, I, I know I encourage them. Um, you know, I know the, the members of the commission encourage them too. Uh, and, you know, those occasions and those opportunities do exist. But, you know, you have to work together with the entities to make it happen. Correct. I agree. Financial management is crucial for the uh, sustainability of the port. Eddie, what approach would you take to effectively manage the port's budget and financial resources, ensuring fiscal responsibility and stability? Well, again, I think, well, what I understand the process. I only, I only had to go through that process 17 times in my 16 years there of the budget process and everything that goes into it. But, I, I, you know, it gets back to, again, you know, you exercise prudent care make prudent decisions. Uh, uh, you know, I've always been very conservative in my approach to other people's money. And certainly, you know, the porch money is the, the public's money. And so I, I, I think that, you know, you continue to, uh, you know, to, to provide oversight, you continue to scrutinize, you, know, you make sure rules are being followed. Uh, and, and, and again, you do not spend beyond your means. Uh, now, there may be different people that say, well, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. But, you know, running a large business requires a lot of things. You know, everything that from, you know, making sure you have the adequate staff and that they have the effort tools to do their job. You know, we're in a competitive environment. This COVID changed everything. You know, you know, you have to pay your employees a competitive way. And, and that means you know, having to bite the bullet at times and acknowledging that, you know, if, you're mar if, you're, if, if your salaries are not at market wage with everybody else, you're going to lose people. Uh, and, you know, the hardest thing to do is replace a good employee. You know, if somebody has worked for you for more five years, you've made the decision that employee is a good employee. We want to keep them. Well, you know, I think what COVID showed is everybody had to up their game. You know, you're going to have to pay a competitive wage because people have choices now. Uh, and there's a lot of jobs at the port. The port itself as an organization is one, but everybody else too. And so, uh, again, I think being prudent, uh, you know, exercising fiscal responsibility, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, there are mechanisms put in place to, uh, to adequately uh, monitor how money is being spent, how the budget is being executed. And again, that's one of the things that the commission has ultimate oversight and authority is you know, how is that money uh, actually being spent? You know, they approve the budget. You know, you you, you amend the budget as necessary. Uh, you can uh, um, authorize projects to be implemented. All of those decisions occur at the commission level. And you know, again, I I know that process well. I know it intimately and. And then I, I believe that I can certainly bring uh, what is necessary to ensure that you know, the port continues to make good decisions with its money. And then budget oversight is a key responsibility. I think that's one of those things that you signed up for, for that, for that judiciary, the, the fiduciary responsibility to be a steward of that money and, 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 and make sure it's done prudently and, and, and it serves uh, the interests of the port and, and it's necessary. Security and safety are paramount concerns for any port. Eddie, how do you plan to enhance security protocols and ensure the safety of operations at the port, drawing from your experience in risk management and operational safety? Well, one is 
uh, you know, there's different levels of responsibility. Um, on this, on the safety of, you know, the port and access to the port, you know, again, that falls under Homeland Security rules. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and the, it is the responsibility of the port to ensure, uh, you know, to have certain measures uh, that, you know, basically screen who is coming in and out of the port. I mean, that's all part of the 9-11 response. Um, the Port of Brownsville is one of only two, maybe three ports in the state of Texas that actually have their own police department. So those police officers at the port are, are police officers that have all the credentials and certificates and licenses, just like if they can be a police officer in every any entity, any law enforcement agency in the state. Uh, but they're, they work for the port. It's not a contracted service. Same thing goes with the security personnel. Those are all employed. The, the port is responsible for screening everybody that goes in and out of the port to ensure that the land footprint of the port is secure. Within the port, you have entities that also are responsible for security. You just can't walk into any business. That everybody has a certain level of responsibility that needs to be met. Um, if you're in the energy business, for example, if you're you know handling refined product like the gasoline terminals, lot they have to have their own security plan. They have to have their own security standards. They have to have their own uh, security to ensure that that facility uh, is always uh, meeting the federal requirements for standard of care as it relates to security access. So all of those components come into play. Coordination, there's a lot of coordination between the port and the federal agency, primarily Customs and Border Protection. You know, ships coming in, uh, they have to be inspected. A ship just has to show up at the port the next morning. You know, it has to come, it has to be cleared, it has to be inspected by the Coast Guard, it has to clear uh, if it's a foreign flag, you know, a custom and border protection when it gets to the dock. It has to be boarded. It has to also be inspected. Uh, the police department is responsible for once it hits the docks to maintain the security perimeter of that. So all of those things are part of what is necessary. Now, that's the security part about it. The safety issue, you know, that's a whole different matter. But I will tell you that because of the nature of the types of businesses that are at the port, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there. And it can be a dangerous place to work. But I know with the, with the businesses at the port, with the stevedore agencies, it's a culture of safety. It 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 is constant safety. Uh, it because again, all it takes is one misstep or whatever, uh, and you can have a serious accident, something serious. Occurs. So I I know a lot of those. I, I I've been to some of their safety meetings. Uh, the port, the same thing. You know, it's you know sa safety has to be a culture. It's not something you do every once in a while. It has to be constant. Um, most things happen because of human error, and so how do you how 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 do you prevent that as best you can? It's just constant, you know, safety enforcement, safety training, uh, you know, adequacy, uh, making sure that everybody, uh, you know, uh, the goal of every employer is to get their employee home at night to the family, and so everybody, it's it's a team effort, you know, you know, some have it better than others. Um, but but safety is a culture at the port. It really is, uh, because those entities uh, who are involved in in certain activities that you know require uh, you know if, um, uh, you know if something goes wrong, it can be serious consequences. I mean, they they, they just have to preach it uh, as a culture of the company, and and a lot of that goes on at the port. Compliance with regulations is essential for maintaining the port's operations. Eddie, how will you ensure that the port remains in compliance with relevant regulations and standards, ensuring adherence to legal and regulatory requirements? Well, one is you have to have the staff and you have to have the training to certainly ensure that all of those regulations are adhered to. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a significant federal layer of regulation over the port. You know, it, it really isn't, you know, ensuring safety, uh, there's so many protocols that have to be followed. Uh, again, uh, it's it's you know it's an international place. It's a it's a it's a, a large domestic space, and so all of that has to be followed. Now, 
the reason that's important why the port has to do that because there's consequences for not doing it. For example, if there's a lot of breaches of security, you know, it's, it's, it, it is possible that you, the port would se face severe fines uh, for lapses of security breaches. You know, whenever something happens at the port, it has to be reported to the national level because it comes under the federal standard. And so if you have a lot of those, you can be severely fined. It is conceivable, although I don't know that it has ever happened, that if you have so much of that, that the feds could come in and say, you know what, we're going to take over the operation. That might happen in ports that maybe have a, a more of a military designation because they serve the military, where the military has the authority to come in and take over. But, you know, those are, while they might be far-fetched, those are possible. So there are serious consequences when security measures are not followed. The Coast Guard routinely inspects the port for the water side operations, for the access to the docks, as well as its land side operations. And annually, it has to pass inspections by the federal. And if you don't do that, you know, you either have to fix the problem, or in some cases, you can be fined. Uh, and some of the fines can be heavy. Uh, I think the port hasn't experienced a whole lot of that, but it is possible. So, you know, again, it's not one of those things you just kind of, huh, okay, let's just do it once a year. It is pretty constant because there's such a, a layer of, of federal oversight at the port. Um, at the state level, not as much. Uh, that's mostly on the regulatory aspects of maybe environmental with the general land. When there's a spill, for example, somebody may be loading a ship and the, there's a rupture of the pipe and, and, and you know, uh, gasoline or diesel may spill it. That is a reportable thing immediately. So you have those elements as well. On uh, And so... Um, you know, it's a heavily regulated environment. Uh, the port is part of that. Port has a responsibility. And some of them are regulating the businesses that are doing those at the port as well. So it's it's a kind of very layered, uh, but it, it isn't something that, you know, happens every once in a while. It is pretty constant. Um, um, the, the LNGs, for example, um, you know, just because they got a permit doesn't mean that's it. No, they will repeatedly have to submit uh, uh, regulatory uh, reports uh, on how they're doing, what is achieving. Uh, you know, there is consequences for not doing that because the nature of some of those operations uh, is pretty significant and they're not done per uh, correctly. So oversight from the port's perspective starts with having the adequate staff and the adequate training uh, to ensure that the port is doing its part. Uh, and, and the same thing goes for all those industries that are out there. They have to do their part because if not, uh, in, you know, there's consequences for uh, for not doing so. Promoting diversity and inclusion is essential for the port's workforce and leadership. Eddie, what initiatives will you implement to foster diversity within the port's workforce and leadership, ensuring equitable opportunities for all? Well, I think that uh, yeah, that's important. I know that uh, while I was port director, um, you know, um, for many years, uh, well, the deputy port director was a female, uh, well, hired hired women for leadership positions. Um, uh, same thing goes for opportunities for uh, lesser positions. You know, I think we have a philosophy, or certainly the, the, the philosophy that, that, that I had was that we created those opportunities. Uh, it, you know, the, the, if, if you're qualified to do that job, uh, doesn't matter whether you're a woman or a man. Uh, you know, you've had an opportunity to compete. Um, positions of leadership are currently in the port. Holdovers from when I was there. You know, half of the staff, department directors, are women, and it's not only in in you know the ones that people would think. Oh well, this you know woman has to sit. No, no. Again, uh, leadership, deputy ports director, you know, directors of finance. Uh, we have some positions. Uh, even in the area of the harbor master's office, uh, women working out on the docks uh, in the facilities maintenance, women in leadership of being foremen. And so, you know, those opportunities, uh, I think, have always been supported and certainly fostered over the last 16 years, uh, and they need to be. Uh, but the same thing also holds for, um, uh, you know, diversity uh, uh, as well in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, the capabilities of giving people the opportunity. I mean, you know, one of the ways to foster diversity in your organization is to allow for upward mobility, you know. 
give the people who work for you, who have, you know, proven themselves as, as people that you want to uh, train and allow them to grow within your organization, is to allow them that, that, that mobility too. Uh, you can promote a lot of diversity to that process. So uh, I just think that's very important in, in, in the organization. You know, people come at things different ways when you have a diverse mindset. And, uh, and, and, and you have to develop it at the leadership level all the way down to the ground. Collaboration among commissioners is vital for effective governance and strategic planning. Eddie, how do you plan to foster collaboration and consensus among your colleagues, ensuring effective decision-making and progress? Well, I, I will uh, commit to do my part to, uh, one is uh, promoting uh, uh, effective, uh, honest, uh, you know, a dialogue. I mean, you know, five people are going to be entrusted with making the decisions that make the port. I, I think that, you know, another, the only way to foster that is to have open dialogue with each other. Uh, sometimes it's hard to say things, but, you know, sometimes you, you reach the biggest consensus when you become uncomfortable and address issues that need to be addressed. You know, avoiding, um, avoiding, uh, conversations, uh, that might seem controversial or, or that might make people uncomfortable. Well, is it always the best thing to do? I, I'm, I will just do my part to be, um, um, accessible to my peers, to, to, uh, you know, be honest and to, um, uh, you know, talk openly. Um, uh, and, and, uh, I hope everybody would feel that way. Uh, but you know, that, that's important. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you, if you can't communicate, um, uh, on issues, uh, you know, I think that's a problem. And, uh, I certainly, uh, uh, don't want to be part of a problem. Eddie, under your leadership, what major infrastructure projects were successfully completed at the Port of Brownsville and how did these projects contribute to the port's growth and development? Well, I, I guess, you know, those that were, uh, initiated and completed, probably the biggest ones come the major infrastructure projects, such as, you know, the construction of cargo dock 16, um, the construction of liquid cargo dock, um, uh, number six, uh, the repairs to docks. I mean, the, the port last built a dock in like the year 2000, um, in the 16 years that I was there, we built two brand new docks. We repaired four of the existing docks. We've improved the docks. You know, those are all paramount because those are so vital to the port's interest. Uh, th those have to be, uh, but there's been a lot of capital improvements. You know, the road repairs are all done by the port. Uh, expansion of, of uh, uh, infrastructure such as water and sewer line replacement, all of those have been done at the port. Uh, but probably the biggest one, because it was the hardest and most difficult to actually do, and that was the deepening of the ship channel. I mean, you know, that project took all of the 16 and a half years that I was there to see it go through the process. It's a federal process. It is something that it can, it is not done quickly. It is not cheap. And in, in our country, in the United States, that process of doing is broken. You know, in other countries, you can, you can get something like that done in a short order. It took from the port, it was already started the process of the dialogue of the deepening of the ship channel when I arrived in 2007. And it wasn't until really this past year, uh, that the project began and and again i believe the deepening of the ship channel is the most important project in the port's future because it talks about the sustainability but but that was a significant effort and a significant success and that's that is one that may be the last one we ever do so that's got to be the pinnacle of the projects but there was so many others you know again you know building docks repairing roads, replacing old infrastructure. I mean, some of the, 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 the water pipes and the sewer pipes are 70 years old, all of them get them replaced. Uh, you know, the building of a new administrative building, the building of a security and police building, uh, the Harbor master's office, 
the the entrances to the port. I mean, th- there's been a lot done to the port over the last course of time in terms of infrastructure investment, probably more than any other period. So all of those are important and all of those are necessary to continue moving forward in that road to progress at the Fort of Brazil. Now, the, the deepening of the ship channel, what, uh, can you go a little bit deeper into like the importance, what is going to be able to be accomplished now versus what wasn't? Well, the, bigger, be- the biggest thing is you're going to be able to bring uh, bigger vessels that have what they call a deeper draft. In other words, that they're, that they're going to need deeper water. Right now, the ship channel is 42 feet. That's the, the draft, the depth. So that limits a vessel to probably a maximum of about 39 feet. So you, because you, you have to leave, you know, some space between the bottom and the bottom for what they call squad and all that. So we have a customer right now, for example, says, you know, I, I want to bring in, instead of bringing 50,000 tons of steel, I want to bring in 80,000 tons of steel, but I'm going to need 42 feet, 44 foot draft to be able to do that because for them, it's one, it's, 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 uh, it's more efficient. And then the cost per unit is so much cheaper. And so, so the only way to be able to provide them that capability is having to enlarge the ship chat and deepen it. Uh, and so that's why that's so important because that customer wants to grow at the port. And if they can't grow at the port because their cost of shipping the commodity to the port continues to increase, where there's no way for them to make gains in that, they may look elsewhere to go, where another fort that has deeper water. And so that's why that project's so important. Uh, the original premise, because you know it's being, it's being dug from 42 feet to 52 feet. That's a substantial amount. And one of the biggest reasons for that too was Keppel Anfels. You know, Keppel Anfels does the offshore drilling rigs, or more importantly, there is a lot of what they call drill ships now. Uh, they, they're getting away from those rigs because they have these drill ships. Drill ships are basically a boat that can also drill. And the reason they're doing more and more is because those vessels are easier to deploy, they're easier to move, they're more agile. Well, if they need to come in for repairs, you know, for example, at Keppel Anfels, they can't because there's not enough draft, there's not enough depth in the water to allow them to come in. So it's keeping up with that industry. Uh, again, vessels are getting larger, cargoes are getting larger, wind blades are coming at the port of Brownsville from overseas or leaning from overseas, those boats are getting bigger. So you have to be able to grow with that industry to be able to accommodate their growth. And some of their growth is being propelled by larger vessels. So that's why that's so important. Attracting new businesses is crucial for the economic growth of the port. Eddie, what initiatives did you need to attract new industries and businesses to the port during your tenure? And what were the outcomes of these efforts? Well, uh, there's two things about that too, is that you might, people may have differences of opinion. You know, for, for me is you attract businesses based on your business model. And at the port means you have land, but it's not about the rent. It's about you come to the port because you need to be there because you need the services of the port, you know, the ship channel the unloading of cargo and all that, that's what complements that business model. It, it isn't just collecting rent. It's also the money that is generated through the use of the facilities at the port. And so that's the business. Environmental sustainability is a priority for the port. Eddie, how, do you, how did you prioritize sustainability efforts during your time as executive director? And what steps did you take to minimize the environmental impact of port operations? The, um, well, you know, there's two ways of doing it. You know, port operations is distinct than companies who want to come into your port and build a facility that, you know, we might have environmental concerns about. Port does not operate the businesses for a, somebody who comes in. We operate our own business and our business is mostly the loading and unloading of cargo. Uh, uh, so in that respect, I, I, I can, it gets back to what I talked about. Innovation is coming, you know, getting away from, uh, your cranes using diesel to more, uh, electrification or using a non-greenhouse gas fuel. You know, we see a lot of movement in the shipping industry to, you know, those non-green uh, gas fuels like green hydrogen, green ammonia, 
those are things that are being developed in the industry, uh, not only in this country, but you know, all over the world. Those are standards that are being developed. And over time, you'll start to see moving away from you know, using diesel to operate cranes and things of that nature to, to probably green hydrogen, green ammonia, things of that nature. But the bigger part of that challenge was, you know, uh, is businesses that want to come in. What is it that they do? You know, we don't have a refinery at the Port of Brazil, you know, a, a, a gasoline refinery. We don't have any significant petrochemical. Those, you know, you really need to get comfortable with those facilities in as it relates to what is that environmental impact. You know, what is the footprint of that company? Is that something we really want? Uh, do we want to do that? And, and then also being familiar with the regulatory climate because so much of that might be the easier thing to say, well, we want a refinery and we say, yes, let's get one. But you rely on someone else that's going to vet them environmentally, like it could be the federal government, it could be the state government. But at the end of the day, you still need to be comfortable that you want that industry in your court. <laughs> and I'll tell you that there was a lot of discussion throughout and it's not just you know myself i mean i'm talking about as the board director was the collaborative issue with the commission and there were some things that we didn't feel fit the port of browsing uh, i think today you know, there may be a lot of debate about lng but at the end of the day when you look at the hydrocarbon industry it's probably the one that's the most benign and, and natural gas is going to be a bridge to get the the world and the country off of using greenhouse gases and moving to non greenhouse alternative fuels. But that's going to happen over the course of a long time. It isn't going to happen. We stop, we, you know, we stop today and it starts tomorrow. That's not going to work. So that was one issue that there was a lot of discussion about. Uh, there was a lot, you know, some debate about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the port was comfortable with the strict environmental scrutiny. Uh, and the regulatory environment that these companies had to lean and portray. And our process was simple. Our, our thoughts was, you know, we, we went and looked at them. We saw, we felt that, you know, this was not a refinery. It wasn't going to have the, the, you know, the plumes of, of, of that dirty smoke and flaring and, and, you know, issues to deal with it, to deal with some of those elements. Uh, but we felt strongly that the environment, the, the regulatory environment was very um, was going to be very uh, uh, strict with these facilities. That was going to scrutinize them heavily, and it was simple. If these companies could not demonstrate their ability to meet all of the heavy requirements placed upon them, don't approve them. We're okay with that. We're not going to go to bat for them because we want you to, you know, treat them separately or 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 ignore the rules. No, if they could not adequately satisfy all of the requirements of, of placed on them by these regulatory agencies, don't approve them. We're okay with them. But if you, but, but if they do, then why would you not approve them? And so that was the other element of that. But, but I mean, I, I just think you, you need to know, you know, what element, you know, who is involved, you know, what is the regulatory environment and, 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 you know, ask those questions before you make a decision. Uh, but I do see, you know, more and more in this environment, you know, social justice, environmental justice has been becoming more important and, and, and ports are going to have and are upping their game to be able to address all of those concerns. Eddie, could you discuss significant partnerships or collaborations you facilitated to enhance the port's operations and economic impact? And how did these partnerships contribute to the port's success? Well, probably the biggest one and the one that I think is you know, again, the most important one and will have the biggest impact is the partnership that was developed with the next decade uh, for not only having the LNG project, uh, but also for addressing the deepening of the ship channel. Um, you know, the port might be seen here as a big port, but it's not. I mean, it's not a Houston, it's not a Corpus. So in our community is a poor community. I mean, we don't have the the resources to raise millions and millions of dollars to undertake a project of that nature. So uh, we collaborated with the LNGs to essentially undertake the uh, construction of the ship channel deepening 
for about 60 percent of the total amount uh and that uh took a lot um uh give you an example you know the um the the, the project may cost up to 400 million dollars and the ability of to find someone who is going to contribute the money to build you know 250 to 300 million dollars of that is significant and that left the rest of the piece to be done with the Ford and the government the federal government and so that project is being done in what is called the public private partnership where it does leverage the private sector investment to undertake that project and reduce the cost not only to the port but to the federal government as well and so they're going to do that and then at the part where they stop which is a lesser amount uh, into the port, that's where the port is going to be working with the federal government and the Corps of Engineers to do that piece. Uh, that by far is probably the biggest one of those, you know, collaborative efforts that we did. But we did a lot of projects at the Port of Brownsville where we collaborated with the tenant to undertake the improvement. Uh, and we would work with them to secure grants. So. Uh, we work with the grain elevator folks, for example, to um, uh, help them. Um, they uh, they agreed to uh, undertake investment in the ele elevator. Uh, they invested $13 million, and we agreed that we would do repairs to the dock that is necessary for them to use. Um, we spent about $6 million. They spent roughly 13 so we collaborated. Uh, we got some projects through grants where um, we collaborated with that entity to, we would apply for the grant, meaning that it was so much money that would be funneled through the port, but the those most of those grants are grants where you have to match them. In other words, you know, you may have to provide 25% or 40% of the match to get the grant. Well, they paid for that match. They paid for the local match. So at the end of the day, the port didn't pay any money. What it did was it became the recipient of that money that made that project happen and provided them a way of being able to spend forty uh, percent of the project. That but they got a hundred percent of it. In other words, for every forty cents they put in, they got sixty to make the project happen. So the, we were always looking for ways to collaborate in that way. We did that with Keppel Landfills. We did that with the folks at the Grain Elevator. Uh, we did it with some of the other dock projects. So uh, I think that's an effective way to do that. Uh, but always looking for ways. Uh, uh, we collaborated with the county on projects, with the regional mobility, with the state of Texas, uh, where projects got built, but it had a lot of participants in those projects to make them a reality. There's a road that was built at the port. It's the first we call the South Port Connector, connecting Boca Chica to the south uh, side of the port. And that that 1.9 mile long road costs like 26 and a half million dollars. Well, that was a collaboration between the port, the city, the county, the regional mobility, the the the, the Department of Transportation at the state level, and the federal government uh, through the Department of of Transportation as well. And and you know without that collaboration, without everybody coming to the table, that probably wouldn't have ever gotten built. So. Those are the opportunities that exist, and and you know the port has taken advantage of those. I'm always looking, willing to partner to. Uh, it's come with that that a Devito deal, you know, somebody else's money. Sure, we're always willing to do that. <laughs> Overcoming challenges is part of effective leadership. Eddie, how did you navigate obstacles faced by the port during your tenure, and what strategies did you employ to overcome these challenges and drive progress? Well, again, I probably probably think the biggest challenge was the channel deepening project you know it started with a concept that nobody believed in and you know we developed it we refined it we sold it we demonstrated it would work and ultimately you know we went everywhere so, you know locally state federal washington wherever to go tell that story about how uh, that project could occur by reversing the model of depending on the federal government to fund the project and instead have a private sector interest fund the project. And finally, after all those years of, of going uh, places and trying to get Congress to allocate money to the project, 
uh, we got it done. And today, that project is the only navigation project being funded under this P3 model. First one ever done in the country, and it may be the model for the rest of the nation going forward. But you know, that was persistence, you know, working and going, sallying, um, you know, just this again until somebody came up with a better plan. <laughs> We stuck to it, and we were very persistent, and uh, we were very effective in in in, in uh, driving collaboration and support at all levels of government. That you know, ultimately, it came through, and so that's got to be the biggest one. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, challenges are come in all shapes and sizes. So there could be people challenges, there could be operational challenges, there could be simply challenges with. With again, how do you make these projects happen? Uh, and a lot of it is, you know, if, hey, if you have a good plan, you, you trust your, you've got, you've got support. Um, you know, some of it is just, it, 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 it is just, you know, sticking with it and being persistent, uh, being confident, uh, and it will happen. Um, you know, you're not going to force something down somebody's throat if they don't believe uh, in your ability to uh, perform so at the end of the day uh, you know challenges like I said come in all shapes and sizes but probably the biggest challenge that I think is most meaningful for the port was finding the way to get the channel deepening project done and uh, you know I remember people telling me I was crazy but you know, at the end of the day guess what we got it done Eddie you could you discuss any awards or recognitions received by the port under your leadership? And what now what do you attribute these successes to in terms of your leadership and strategic direction? Um, you know, accolades or awards, you know, the port, you know, in, in recent years uh has been recognized for some of its marketing and communication pieces. Um uh, I mean the 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 fact that uh we were the the fact that we were making inroads into uh, being recognized in the state of Texas as an up and coming port, you know, where the where the port of Houston and the port of Corpus and the port of Beaumont are all aware of what is going on, and 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 recognize those efforts through the Texas Ports Association or through our participation with the Department of Transportation, uh, I participated. Uh, as a member of the what they call the Port Advisory Committee at the state level, um, you know those recognitions uh, and appointments to me were always important awards because they may not mean they may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but in the scheme of the port industry, those are very important. Um, uh, I see there's probably a lot more, uh, you know, recognitions that you know i i would say the port is a port community received uh, and mostly those are on you know being able to uh, address um you know how uh, we begin to you know bridge that divide between the community and the port as it relates to kind of you know rebuilding that confidence in the port uh there was a lot of things we did in terms of communication pieces that as an industry at the national level, the port was recognized for those efforts, its publications, its 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 annual report. Um, probably one of the ones that was a goal of mine that we got was uh, there is a, a a recognition that ports or governments receive, especially um, 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 you know uh, governmental counties, the city, the county. What well, it's called uh, a certificate of achievement by the. Uh, finance officers association and that is when you do your annual report and they do what they call a CAF or comprehensive annual financial report that has to meet certain standards and it is judged by the um, the the the, uh, the financial uh, um, officers association nationwide and if you achieve that that's kind of a pinnacle of being the highest financial standards when we did that, that was one of the things that I wanted to do. We did that under my watch, and I think the Fort now in its its his thirteenth or twelfth consecutive year being recognized for financial performance, and that to me was an important award because it addressed the issues of 
you know, again, financial management, financial prudency, uh, never being written up for, you know, issues relating to how you spend your money or how you care for it. It's just a standard that, that was very important to be able to say, hey, we have it too. You know, the city of Brownsville has it. The county has it. A lot of entities, the port did not have that. Now, it, 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 you don't want to be the guy that doesn't get it that one year because there's, you want to be able to get it every year and the port has consistently performed at those highest standards to be recognized for its financial reporting and its financial accounting. That's probably the one that I think is the one I would think is the most important. Most important. Eddie, I've, it's been, you know, I've enjoyed this time that I've, that I've been able to spend with you. Um, I've learned a lot, a lot more than when I came in. I learned a lot more right now than, than I've learned in the last 40 years, right? Um, which is fantastic. Very interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences, right? And your credentials. Uh, it's just a great, uh, you are a great um, tool of knowledge, right? Um, that a lot of us, we're not aware of, you know, how the Port of Brownsville operates and and we go into death, right, with everything that we spoke about. So I just want to thank you, you know, from our In-City Hotspots Biz Chant podcast. Um, is there anything else you would like to, um, is there anything else you would like to share uh, before we, we wrap it up? Anything you would like to share with the community uh, to, uh, to go out and vote? Well, you know, local, local decisions matter. And on May 4th, there's going to be local elections, not only for the Port Commission, for the Texas Outmost College, think uh, the city might have an initiative as well, the school board, you know, and those decisions are important because those are truly made at the local level. And so the thing I would say more to everyone, please go out and vote. And of course, if you're going to vote in the, in the port election uh, for port commission, uh, I am a candidate for a position uh, on the board of uh, uh, port commissioners. It's place three on the ballot and certainly would uh, be honored to receive uh, your, 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 uh, um, the folks that follow you and listen to you, and, uh, you know, their support would be gratefully, uh, be a lot of gratitude and, you know, go out and vote. If you can find it in your heart to vote for me, please do so. Eddie, just some last, uh, fun, fun facts, okay. right? That people want to know about, about Eddie. Okay. Um, so he's going to ask you a couple questions and you're going to choose either one. Okay. It's something fun that we like to do at the end of our shows. Okay. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee. Phone call or text? Oh. Summer or winter? Winter. Comedy or drama? Comedy. Rain or sunshine? I'll take the sunshine. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Early bird. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, Eddie, one, one last time. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we want to invite everyone to go out and vote. Like Eddie said, uh, go out and show your support for Place 3, being the commissioner Place 3. That's correct. And we'll see us uh, stay tuned and we'll see you for our next episode of our Biz Champs podcast. Eddie, thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciated the opportunity and certainly enjoyed it. Our pleasure. Great success. Our pleasure. Thank you.